This morning, I'm going to minister uh, with a word that I believe the Lord laid upon my heart to give to us this morning. God with us. And um, as the Christian world is, you know, celebrates today as a Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus was welcomed to Jerusalem and honored as a king by the same people who agitated for his death. Now, um, I want you to know that Jesus did not go through that just for the sake of going through it. He went through all of that because of you and me. Amen? Amen. And we're going to see through the scripture today, we're going to look at Jesus as a man. But we're going to also look at his divinity. And I want you to know as I think, as I know that you know in this house that Jesus is fully God and fully man. And everything that Jesus went through, he didn't go through as God. He went through as man. To identify with us. And I dare say, Jesus is right in the trenches even before he got there. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you will go through. Jesus is there. God with us. Amen. Amen. Turn your Bible with me this morning to John chapter 19. And I'm going to read from verse 1 to 16. John 19 from verse 1 to 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Translation. I'll read from verse 1 to verse 16 of John chapter 19. So then, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold, the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law according to our law. He ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered, you could have no power at all against me, unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has a greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement. But in Hebrew, Gabbatha, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he said to the Jews, behold, your king. But they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. 
Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he delivered him to them to be crucified. Then he took Jesus and led him away. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the reading of your word. And I pray that every ear be open and every heart be attentive to your word this morning. I commit myself unto you that I will not speak of myself, but I will speak as a ready writer. I was ready to sing the praise of his king. I pray that, Lord God, you speak through me, that beyond every word that I speak, your voice will be heard in the name of Jesus. I pray that this morning you will confirm your word with signs and with wonders in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So this morning what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at the personality of Jesus as a man, but we're also going to look at, you know, his, his divinity. We're going to look at his suffering and how that impacts us or that, how that relates to us. Then I'll give you an invitation to share of his glory. And of course, the best, uh, the first place I want to start with, it starts with his divinity that is, he is God. Amen. You know, um, I was um, going on my, uh, on my high street and I saw this banner. And I noticed that what was written on the banner is that Muslims also love Jesus. And I was curious to know the Jesus that they love. And I asked the guy, I said, which Jesus do you love? The one that is dead or the one that is living? Because the one that I know and have a relationship with is the one that is living. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And the relevance of Jesus is not just knowing him by name, is but by knowing who he is. And you cannot separate his divinity from his humanity. You see, Jesus is where God brought salvation and humanity and divinity together to give us hope, to give us healing, and to give us deliverance. Hallelujah. And I want to say to you this morning that because God is with us and because he's been where we are, he's been where we're going, or where you've been, you have no reason to carry with you the burden of sin. Amen? Amen. Let's look at a few scriptures. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is begotten of God, which implies to us that he originated from God. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, He said, but while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to marry your wife, for that which is conceived in her is a Holy Spirit. One of the things that I've learned over my short journey in life is that I'm yet to find someone that criticized Jesus. I'm yet to find someone that says anything negative about Jesus. Even those who don't believe that he's the son of God or don't believe that Christianity is the way or Jesus is the way, I don't, I'm yet to find someone that criticized Jesus. You can say all sorts of things about church, about Christianity, about religion, but Jesus, it's just so hard to criticize him. I mean, it's, even the devil, as hard-working the devil is, do you realize that the devil has nothing wrong to say about Jesus? You think about it. Amen? 
And this is Jesus who came as man. Praise the Lord. His oppression on earth was man, not as God. In Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit, when Mary was contemplating and wondering, how shall this be? He said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that only one who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And Jesus declared in John chapter 10, verse 30, that I am a father, I one. But God had to demonstrate to us that he demonstrated, in fact, I say the highest demonstration of God's love to humanity is giving us his son. He said in John chapter 3, verse 6, he said, For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave. He didn't love us by just telling us. He gave. But we will also see the purpose of that giving. Why did he give? Why are we here today celebrating Palm Sunday or Easter? Why do we have a relationship with him? If you think about it, before you knew him, before you have a relationship with him, he had a relationship with you first. Because the Bible says, for while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. Amen? Amen. So Christ's love or God's love is not determined or dependent on our affection with him. Before you knew him, he had gone ahead and demonstrates that love. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it said, But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. In Philippians, Paul chapter 2, Paul told us how Jesus did not mind his status as God, but came and took the form of humanity. And if you look at our text in verse 5, when Pilate presented Jesus to the people, he didn't present God. He presented the man. And what I want to establish this morning is also understand that, yes, God is, Jesus is God, right? But he's dealing here on earth was man. He went through all he went through as man. You know, if you look at the account of the scripture, he was not excited going to the cross. Nevertheless, he went through that process. The Bible says, for the joy that was set before him. Why Jesus was feeling the pain of the suffering before the cross and everything, the joy that you will be here today got him through that pain. And what I'm saying is that he went through the pain barrier because of the bigger hope that is set before him, you and I. Where have you been? Where are you? Where will you be? God is with us. Amen? And when you look at, when you look at the things that he suffered, you see that the suffering, the excuse for the suffering in the hands of the Jew was that he was blasphemous. In other words, he devalued the essence of God. 
Because he said, I am a father, I won. Because he said, your sins are forgiven. And as far as they're concerned, how can you ordinary man, a carpenter's son, equate yourself with God? That's blasphemy. But you know what? Blasphemy and the second accusation, treason, that he called himself a king. Although he didn't call himself a king, they called him king. And as far as they're concerned, that's an affront to Caesar. In other words, he committed treason against Caesar. And for that reason, he needs to be punished. Now, all of those, all everything that happened didn't happen just for the sake of it. When you look at blasphemy and treason, that's the heart of sin against God. In Genesis chapter 3, we saw when Eve came, uh, when Satan came to Eve and told, um, and told her to partake of the, of the tree, of the fruit of the tree that God has asked them not to touch. Eve said, the day we eat it, we'll die. Satan said, surely that's not the case. The reason why God wants you not to eat it is because when you eat it, you'll be able to discern for yourself what is good and what is bad. In other words, what Satan was saying is that, look, at the moment, you depend on God. At the moment, you ask God for your daily bread. But guess what? Who wants to do that? Why do you need to do that? You can be the master of your future. You can know what is right, what is wrong, and make decisions and make choices for yourself. That's the beginning of sin in man. And you see, without saying that, God, I don't need you, we all do tell God, at this moment in my life, I don't need you. Sometimes we come to church and we're still saying, God, I don't need you. We're going through stuff Instead of going to God, we run away from him. Do you know how many people that are stayed away from church because they're going through issues? And they say, I hear this often, I just want to sort my life out first. Uh Can I tell you what? There's no life you've got to sort out. Everything is in the palm of his hands. Hallelujah. But when you reach out to him and give that unto him, then you see the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 10 and 11. It really says, For it was fitting for him, for whom all things, I want you to know that, for whom all things, not some things, all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God with us. He said, 
to make the captain of their salvation. Salvation in Greek means complete healing, complete deliverance, complete prosperity, everything complete, just as it was. To make the, the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. And what I'm saying to us is that the sufferings that Jesus experienced is because he knew that we will go through that. But you see, God is not with us because he's championing a cause or is championing something that is trending in the society. You know how you hashtag when you are on social media and you find something that is trending and when you comment on it, then you get more followers and, and the likes? No, that's not what God is doing. God is properly identifying with where we are. Not just for us to recognize it, but to take us out of it. Amen? Is a captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason is not ashamed to call them brethren. Amen? And this is why I say, for this reason you can say, divinity, humanity, and salvation come all together to fully express what the apostles, you know, um, the apostolic creed. Some of you probably have um, uh, Anglican Church of England background or Catholic background, probably be familiar with it. When they say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. Hallelujah. And it goes on and on and on. But let's continue to look at that Hebrews chapter 2 from verse 14. He said, Inasmuch as the children have partaken of the flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. That through death he might destroy him who are the power of death, that is the devil. And what I'm trying to establish here is that, look, you see, Jesus being man went through so many sufferings, so many pains because he knew what the consequence of sin would be. And he went through so that he can deliver us out of this. He said, and release those through fear of death where all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give an aid to the seed of Abraham. You and I are the seed of Abraham. We are the one that Jesus came to give aid to. He said, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like the brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in all things pertaining to God, to make preparation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, being tempted, is able to aid those who are tempted. Being tempted. So God is not making a demand on us that he had not already given us the solution. God is not asking anything of you that he has not done himself. Amen? God is not calling us to holiness because we can be. No, he knows we can and Jesus was not just a nice, holy man 
who told us things, he showed us how to live. He showed us how to experience the glory of the kingdom through the things that he suffered. Amen. Amen. Let me read one more scripture in Hebrews. Hebrews um, chapter 4. From verse 14. It says, Seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us do what? Hold fast our confession. And let me say this. Don't let your circumstances redefine the word of God. Don't let your experience shape or reshape your faith. Sometimes I hear this statement that I went through hell, I almost lost my faith. For me, that statement still doesn't make sense. Because it is in hell that you need Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus descended into the hell to bring people up. So if you are in hell, you should meet Jesus there. Amen? That's even when your faith should be stronger. And that's why I say, don't let your experience shape the word of God. But let the word of God shape your experience. You know, some people have given up that, well, I don't think God can heal me. I don't think God can bless me. I don't think God can because I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, I've prayed, and nothing is changing. You see, many times we pray, the problem is not that God is not hearing us or God has not heard us. The problem is that we have an expectation of what we want God to do. And we are waiting for that specific thing that we placed on God to say to us. God doesn't work like that. He doesn't do our bidding. We do his bidding. Amen? Amen. Look, he said, let me read that um, scripture, verse 14. He said, seeing that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points. Everybody say all points. points. Not some points. All points tempted, in other words, afflicted as we are, yet without sin. In other words, his experience does not impact his relationship with his father. So you and I. Rather, the experience, it will strengthen his relationship with his father. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, what I've realized is that the problem that we have sometimes in church is that we want to get rid of Satan without submitting to God. But the Bible says the way to deal with Satan, if I, I love to say this, Satan has power, right? But he's not full of it. In other words, he's not powerful. Amen? He has power, but he's not full of it. He's not powerful. Because Jesus said, all power, all authority has been what? Hallelujah. And you see, Jesus being the head of the church and we, his body. If all power has been given unto him, if he's all powerful, it means that you and I are what? Amen. 
We are full of God's power. Praise God. And that's why we are seated together within in heavenly places. Not near where the devil is there, far and above. Far and above. You see, one of the things I learned is that, I mean, um, coming from an African heritage where we have seen the devil in colors. <laughs> I say in the West, the problem is that the devil marks itself, is very, it's not obvious. You know, the devil wears suits and tie. The devil wears sandwich, eats sandwich and drinks good latte. But if you're from Africa, maybe Latin America, you know that the devil comes screaming. So you notice it. And sometimes the, the, the disadvantage of that is that you give him more attention than you should give him. A lot of attention for that matter. I remember when I was in the university, one uh, minister came to our university and then I, I, I love to do deliverance. I mean, not that there's anything wrong with deliverance, but I mean, trust me, when I say I love to do deliverance, I love it. I love interacting with the demons, you know. And, you know, come on, no, no, I'm not coming. I'm on it, you know. I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I spent times and hours doing it. Because I didn't actually know the authority that I actually had. Because... And that minister told me that look, when you tell the demons to leave, and when they say, no, they're not leaving, the truth is that because Satan is a father of lies. They lie, making you want to believe that your word has no power, no authority. And as a result, and I thought, my goodness, you bust my bubble. This is my fun time. Now all I just say, God, get out of Jesus and walk away from it. <laughs> what do you mean? But later when I understood how the spiritual hierarchy works, when Jesus says that, look, we are seated within heaven place far above and above, it means that we are seated in a place where the devil and Satan cannot even interact. Amen? Amen? We're on the high table with Jesus. Hallelujah. So, he's with us. Not from a distance. We are on the same table. Amen. And that's why I said, he's been with us every way that we go. Hallelujah. So, you find that that's when Jesus was accused of being blasphemous and being a traitor, that was just the excuse to get him to suffer everything that he suffered. But I want to also establish to us that Jesus, having gone through this, didn't go through them for nothing. Is the God of the abuse. Is a God of the sick and is a God of everyone. And I'm sure, as you know, Satan is on the respect of persons. He doesn't care how much money you've got, he doesn't care your status or position in life. But the good thing or the great news is that we have a God who's not insensitive to our needs. Amen. Look at Isaiah 53 with me. Isaiah 53. In verse 1 of Isaiah 53, I, it's, um, I'm going to form 5, but I just want to highlight something in 53. In verse 1, it said, 
Who has believed our reports? He's asking the question. Who has believed our reports? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, to those who believe the report of the Lord are the ones that, re- that the arm of the Lord is revealed to. The arm of the Lord shows power and strength. So what the prophet is saying here is that, look, for those that experience the hand of the Lord are the ones that believe his word. Amen? Who has believed our report? To whom? The harm of the Lord. So when you believe the report of the Lord, then you experience his power. If you don't believe his report, you would experience his power. There are many people going through stuff in life now and they know everything that the psychologists, that the doctors say about that thing. But they have no clue what the word of God says about the situation. And yet, they wonder why God is not doing anything about it. I was on the streets one day, um, a few weeks ago, actually, I think last week, yes. I was on the streets, you know, um, doing street evangelism. And one guy came to me and said, how come your Jesus is bombing people in Israel? And to be honest, I mean, I put my hands up. My first reaction was anger. Who told you? I mean, how did you even come? to that conclusion. I was even put aback. Then I now showed him scripture that, look, there's no place for violence in Jesus. I said, there's no way. I said, look, even Jesus, when he was arrested, and one of his disciples tried to protect him by cutting the hair of one of those who came to arrest him. He just said, no, there's no time for that. Put your sword away and put the hair back. I said, so, if Jesus didn't do that when he was physically himself in danger, why will he need bombs to protect himself now? And that's why I said, although Jesus was man, he didn't need anything to protect himself. He went through all he went through. He could have, you know, uh, he could have avoided it, but he went through because he knew that you and I will go through that. And he gave us a way out of that situation that we find ourselves. Amen. Amen. So he said, to those who believe his reports, his arm will be revealed. Look at verse 4 and 5. He says, surely, 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 he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteem it stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But verse 5, I mean, verse 5 is my, is a personal testimony for me. I mean, I've shared this in many quarters, so if you've heard this story before, then, you know, I apologize, but, you know, um, Twice, once I've got spoken, twice I've heard, you know. This scripture was a revelation that I got while I was lying in the hospital bed three years ago. That Christmas, I could have spent it in the hospital. And I say, thank God for COVID. Not because it was a great thing. I'm, I'm sure yeah, you probably say, how can you say thank God for COVID? That was what delivered me from the hospital bed. If there was no COVID, I would have definitely spent Christmas and possibly New Year in the hospital. I was discharged not because I was well, but because I was clinically well. That's what my doctor said. In other words, we think you won't die if you go. But you are better off at home recovering than staying in the hospital and catch something else you didn't come with. 
And the Lord gave me this scripture. Verse 5, he says, But he was wounded for our transgressions. God with us. He was wounded not for what he did. He was wounded not for what he did, but for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. In other words, the charge of blasphemy and treason that was placed on him was not because he committed those crimes, but for the sake of you and I. As I said earlier on, when you look at sin, that's the very heart of sin. Blasphemy, discrediting, undermining God, and treason, saying that I don't need God in my life. That's the heart of sin. For our transgression and for our iniquity, it was bruised. And as a result of that, the chastisement of our peace was placed upon him. In other words, whatever that has robbed me of peace, whatever could have robbed me of peace, God placed it on Jesus. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know where you've been. I don't know where you will be. But I want to tell you this morning, the chastisement of your peace that thing that has robbed you of peace, that thing that has robbed you of joy, that thing that you're reeling with in pain right now, relationships in your life that you have lost, do you realize Jesus did not only suffer, he suffered in the very hands of those that he loved, and those that he cared about. Are you here this morning suffering under the hands of those that you love or care about? Or those who are supposed to love you and care about you? I've got news for you. God is with you. And the chastisement of your peace, that which you rob you of peace, is placed upon him. That by his stripes you may be made whole. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I will conclude with this. Matthew chapter 11. Please let the worship band come through. Matthew chapter 11. But before I read that, verse 28 to 30, you know, if you are presented a Christmas gift, I'm sure many of you probably have got gifts that you didn't quite appreciate or you didn't have need for. And some of you probably have some gifts that you have gathering dust somewhere. Whatever reason why that person bought it is because that person thinks that it would be useful for you, but unfortunately, you, didn't, you couldn't find much use for it. 
As a result, you left it gathering dust. Now, I say that to mean that it doesn't matter how expensive, how valuable the gift is. If you don't actually put it to use, you can't enjoy the value. Jesus went through this suffering and this pain so that the chastisement of your peace can be upon him and that you can be healed through those stripes that he receives. And I say this to say, if you're here this morning and you're still carrying the burden of sin, you have no relationship with Jesus. Yes, you're in church, but no relationship with him. I want you to give it up to him this morning. You are here or you're online and you're burdened with one infirmity or the other. I want you to know that Jesus, the healer, Jesus, the one that gives us salvation, not because he's just a lovely guy, but because he went down through the trenches with us. He know what it is to live under the burden of sin. Not because he was a sinner, but because he identified with us. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and every laden, and I will give you and I'll give you rest. But you see, that rest can be experienced without this. He says, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. You are here this morning carrying the weight of sin, carrying the weight of infirmity. I want to encourage you don't live here with that weight. I used an illustration earlier on 9 uh, a.m. I said, if you went to the shop, maybe after the service, you did your shopping, and probably one of those shopping that you were mindful of what you would spend, you know, and you were concerned what the total bill was going to be. And you got to check out, and everything was checked out, and you took out your card or your cash or whatever to pay for it. And the cashier said, no, go on, the bill is already paid. How many of you here, we pick a fight with the cashier and said, how dare you? Stop me from paying. Anyone here? You know, that's the same thing. When you're burdened with sickness, when you're burdened with sin, and you're burdened with a situation, you see, everything that Satan brings us upon us, the strategy is to limit us of becoming who God says we are. Everything. You remember Peter's mother-in-law. The Bible says that she was sick with fever. 
And when Jesus, when she got healed, the Bible says she got up and she began to serve. The purpose of that sickness was so that she can't serve. The reason why you have been afflicted, either mentally, emotionally, or whatever, is so that you can't serve, you can't give what God has put into you. There are a lot of people walking, or maybe here. You don't trust people, you can't, I mean, relationships in your life, you, you have no relation, you can't relate with people because of the disappointments in relationships that you've had. You are broken because of that. It's because Satan knows that the relationship that God is bringing into your lives, that he wants you to... You see, there's something with relationship. No matter how great or wonderful you are, you can't thrive without relationship. You know, when God created all things, he said, they are very good. But he looked at man alone. He said, not good. So the reason why Satan wants to deny you of that relationship, don't want you to trust people, is because God, he knows that God is putting relationships in your life that you need. But because you are broken, because you are bruised and battered. But I want you to remember this morning, the chastisements, of your peace is laid upon him, that by his stripes you may be made whole. Amen. Hallelujah.